Okay. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, thank you, Ravi, for this uh, kind of introduction. And uh, today, I would like to talk a little bit about this unique protein, which is called the uh, mucin. And uh, I will show you how we are trying to develop a specific and selective fluorescent probe for mucin. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna start with the basics. So first of all, what is mucin? Well, mucin, it's one of the biggest and more complex protein within our body. Think that more than 5,000 amino acids compose a single monomer of mucin. And uh, to most of these amino acids are bonded uh, sugars, which are called glycans. And uh, these glycans can be up to 80% of the total mass of the protein. And because of the presence of the glycans, mucin uh, can retain a huge amount of water. And uh, because of its physicochemical properties, mucin can assemble into these um, polymeric glycoconjugates which uh, forms a three-dimensional network around which mucus is organized. And uh, you have to know that basically we have mucus all over the wet surfaces of our body, starting from the eyes, going to the airways and up to the gastrointestinal tract. And um, this uh, three-dimensional matrix uh, formed by mucus, it's extremely important for us because it is the first barrier of the organism against the penetration of, you see, viruses, bacteria, but also drugs. And um, unfortunately, we know really well uh, mucin because of the so-called mucus-related disorders like cystic fibrosis and COPD, where mucin is overproduced and it uh, generates uh, a viscous mucus. But in addition to these mucus-related disorders, in the last years, we are facing an increased interest on uh, mucin, and we are gaining more and more scientific evidence about the implications of mucin in uh, different kinds of uh, tumors. And uh, for example, it has been proposed that secreted mucins uh, could be a diagnostic and prognostic biomarker in uh, pancreatic cancer, which you can see it's the uh, third most deadly type of cancer worldwide. And um, today, one of the most uh, interesting, I would say, uh, methods to detect uh, biomarkers at serum level consists indeed of fluorometric detection mediated by fluorescent probes. And these techniques are really interesting because they are um, simple and relatively cheap. And uh, most importantly, because they are extremely sensitive. And um, we got inspired by this work where the, the authors developed um, a fluorescence probe to detect lipase at serum level. And with this probe, they were able to discriminate between healthy people and people having increased serum level of, of lipase. And so, the, the idea, our idea, it's uh, kind of similar because we are trying to develop uh, a fluorescent probe to be used to detect mucin at serum level and potentially to use this fluorescent probe to, to, to screen between healthy people and people at risk of pancreatic cancer. And um, today, among the most interesting fluorescent probes, we have definitely the, the polymethine dyes, such as quarines, croconines, and cyanines. Um, structurally, these dyes are formed by these polyconjugated bonds flanked by uh, two, two moieties, uh, an electron donor and an electron no. acceptor. And, um, and, and so, sorry. And um, they are really interesting because uh, they are quite photostable in, in solutions and um, they have really high absorption and emission properties and uh, their photophysical properties can be easily tuned by changing the length of these of this, uh, um, polyconjugated bonds or changing the, the functional groups. And for our purpose, we focused on squarings because in the last year, squarings have been widely uh, uh, studied and they found many applications spanning from solar cells to light emitting diode. And uh, even they have been proposed for uh, biological applications. So I, as I was saying previously, 
squareins, as well the other polymethin dyes, are characterized by really high absorption coefficients and uh, high quantum yields and high fluorescence intensities. But this happens only when they are dissolved in organic solvents. In fact, the main drawback of squareins, as well the other polymethin dyes, is that as soon as they get in contact with water, they form insoluble aggregates and uh, the fluorescence is completely quenched. But uh, an interesting phenomenon happening with uh, squareins is that when they get in contact with specific proteins, they can increase their fluorescence. And we call this phenomenon a turn on of fluorescence. And the idea behind this project is trying to exploit this phenomenon to uh, develop a, a fluorescent probe and detect musing using uh, indeed the turn on of fluorescence. So we started by investigating these four squareins. Um, you see all of them have uh, um, a negative charge at pH 7.4 because of the carboxylic group on the lateral moieties. And they belong to, the, to two different classes, one being the indolenin based and the second, the benzoindolenin. And uh, the other differences uh, between them consists of the length of uh, the lateral chain. You see here we have two carbon atoms while here eight carbon atoms. So we started by studying how these molecules interact with the mucin by fluorescence spectroscopy. And uh, here we got really uh, good, good results because for all of the four squareins, we got uh, an increase of the fluorescence. You see with the squareins with the short alkyl chain, we got uh, a mild increase of fluorescence up to fourfold, while the squareins with the longer alkyl chain, we got uh, a higher increase of fluorescence up to 45 fold. And um, yeah, this was quite a good result, but uh, the initial uh, joy was uh, quickly dampened because then we repeated the experiment with uh, using, instead of mucin, we used albumin. And this time we got even higher increases of fluorescence. And um, for our purpose, such a result, it's not good at all, because as you can imagine, uh, at serum level, the most abundant protein is albumin. And consequently, when detected mucin in serum, it could induce a really strong background signal. So again, our purpose is to develop a, a fluorescent probe which responds to mucin but not to albumin. So we, we next try to understand if, if what is the mechanism behind this phenomenon. So we had a look at the structural activity relationship. And here we found uh, an interesting behavior. Uh, for example, if, you have, if we have a look at the turn on, we see that uh, uh, the squareins with the short, uh, short alkyl chain can induce a uh, quite mild increase of fluorescence, while the other with the longer alkyl chain uh, have uh, really strong increases of fluorescence. And uh, we also investigated the kinetics of the interaction by monitoring the time requested to reach an equilibrium and a sort of a plateau. And uh, here again, we see that uh, the more complex is the squareine and the longer is the time requested to, to reach the stability. We also calculated the dissociation constant, which gives us information about the affinity between the, the squareines and, uh, and mucin. And again, we see a, a kind of relationship with the structure of the squareine because the, the more complex is the squareine, the lower is the affinity for mucin. And um, we then put together these experimental data and computed a correlation matrix with some molecular descriptors. And here we got uh, quite an interesting result because we found that lipophilicity could, uh, could, um, could modulate the interaction with mucin. Because uh, for example, these molecular descriptors, the molecular weight, the total surface area, the partition and the distribution coefficient, all of them are related to the lipophilicity of the, of, uh, of the molecule. And basically all of them are strictly correlated and they give us the same information, which in other words is that the higher is the lipophilicity of, this, of the squareine, the higher will be the turn on of fluorescence. But at the same time, the higher the lipophilicity, the lower will be the affinity for mucin. 
and the longer will be the interaction time. And uh, this actually could make sense because when we study the interaction by absorption spectroscopy, uh, we see that increasing the concentration of, the, of mucin actually increases the band corresponding to the monomeric form of, of, uh, of the squarane. While at the same time, the increase of the protein concentration decreases the band corresponding to the H aggregates of, of the squarane. So we speculate that the mechanism behind the interaction with the protein could be uh, a, a kind of disaggregation and solubilization on uh, the lipophilic spots of mucin. Because you have to know that in addition to these uh, really hydrophilic uh, domains, um, which are he heavily gly glycosylated, mucin has also uh, naked portions of the peptide core, which are called cysteine-rich domains. And usually this falls into more hydrophobic um, domains. And so we speculate that the uh, uh, aggregate of squarane could uh, attach and interact on, on these hydrophobic spots. So according to, to these observations, then we wondered if we could increase the selectivity for mucin by increasing the lipophilicity of the squarane. So what we've done was to synthesize new squarenes. And the first thing we've done was to get rid of uh, the carboxylic group on the lateral moieties because they are uh, quite hydrophilic. And then we increase the length of, of the lateral chain up to four carbon atoms. And we obtain this new uh, squarene, which we called it uh, C4, squarene C4. Then we recorded the interaction again with the two proteins. And this time we see that the signal we record with mucin and with albumin is quite overlapped. So uh, this means that on one hand, we reduce the selectivity for albumin, and on the other hand, we increase the, uh, the selectivity for mucin. So it looks like we really modulated the selectivity for mucin by modifying the lipophilicity of the squarene. So in the next step, we wanted to increase even more the lipophilicity of this structure. So we introduced two bromide atoms on, on the lateral, uh, on the indolenin uh, groups. And uh, we obtained this bromide C4 squarene. And for the first time, we were able to uh, get higher responses to mucin with respect to albumin. And this is really a great result, but still we, we have a response to albumin. And for our purpose, it's, uh, it's not suitable because uh, again, we, are, we want to have a dye which responds to mucin, but it's not sensitive to albumin. So because of this, we wanted to increase even more the, so the lipophilicity of uh, the bromide C4. And this time we introduced uh, the benzoindolenin moiety instead of the indolenin. And uh, unfortunately, this new structure, this new squarene was so lipophilic that it, it was completely insoluble in water. And it actually is quite insoluble even in organic solvent. And um, the signal recorded was not reliable. So in this case, we, we had a, a, solubility, a solubility problem. So what, uh, to conclude, what I've just shown you is just is that um, squarenes could potentially be used as uh, fluorescent probes to detect mucin because they can increase their fluorescence in the presence of, of mucin. And among the structures we studied, we found that the bromide C4 is the best performer because it was more selective for mucin with respect to albumin. But we are uh, we plan to, um, to to modulate the structure of uh, bromide C4 to increase its response to mucin, and we also plan to uh, test positively charged squarenes because we we speculate that uh, cationic squarenes could interact with the negatively charged uh, glycans present on mucin by electrostatic interaction, but. Uh, we still have to do all of this and let's see and finger crossed. 
So I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Sonia Vicentin and uh, Nadia Barbero and Carlotta Pontremoli from uh, the MOF lab at uh, the Department of Chemistry here at University of Turin. And uh, last but not least for sure, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cosman. I appreciate you finishing well in time. So we have time for questions, full five minutes. Okay, let me see if there are any hands. Uh, hi, Ravi, I actually have a question. Yeah, sure. So yeah, Luca and then um, Ancona after that. Okay, Luca, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, first, a very nice presentation, thank you. Um, I just uh, had a couple of, so I saw that actually you do see a shift in the emission uh, when you when you move it to the uh, in some yeah some cases it's more it's more uh, uh, stronger like uh, when you have this 45 time announcement you also have a shift uh, in the in the emission peak so first question is could you use this as a as a way uh, beyond the intensity and uh, the other question if is if this uh, protein has a, a structure that was resolved ever so that you could maybe uh, identify better which are the side, the, the position where the dye bind to the protein. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Luca. Really interesting questions. I will start with the first one. Uh, yeah, this could be um, one of the solution, but I don't think uh, it would be reliable because we observe this kind of shift, not only with mucin, but also, sorry, also with albumin and uh, even with other kinds of proteins, because we are testing now, uh, for example, we tested the trypsin, the fibrinogen, and the different other kinds of proteins, because uh, of course, at serum level, we, we, the most abundant protein is albumin, but it's not the only uh, protein. So uh, again, we, uh, we will have uh, the same problem because uh, um, the shift will be observed even with the other problem, with the other proteins. And uh, regarding the structure of mucin, uh, today we don't have the complete structure. Uh, we have some portions, for example, we have uh, resolved the, um, some uh, hydrophobic domains, some, for example, the foam filibrand, which usually is at uh, the, the bottom of the protein, but uh, we don't have the complete structure, especially because mucin, as I, as I was saying, it's highly glycosylated, and um, we don't know exactly uh, how uh, the sugar chains are, are attached to mucin. So, yeah, I hope I, I answered your questions. Okay. Um, now, Ancona, you had a question? Yeah, I think my question already got partially answered because I was going to ask whether you have tested with other proteins that would be present in serum. And it seems like uh, this probe is also interacting with other proteins. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, we um, actually published that uh, that work, and uh, we saw that, um, for example, with fibrinogen and trypsin, we had uh, really high uh, signals, and uh, but usually the most uh, reactive protein, I would say remain albumin so yeah thank you thank you hey i don't see any other hands so cosman i get a chance to ask a question so um is a mucin a membrane bound protein actually does it have a transmembrane part yeah uh, there are two kind of mucins the secreted and the tra transmembrane mucins uh, the, for example, the transmembrane mucin are attached to the cellular membrane with uh, an intracellular domain, and usually this kind of mucin constitutes the first layer of mucus, which mm -hmm. is usually it's more hydrated. But at the same time, there are different um, other kind of mucins, which are the secreted one, which constitutes the upper layer of the mucus, the, the real three-dimensional network created by, by mucins. Yeah. So then, um, and I assume that you're trying to detect the soluble mucins, right? The one that 
actually get secreted out. Isn't that correct? Uh, uh, well, we are using uh, commercial mucins. In this case, we used porcine gastric mucin, which is uh, extracted from uh, the stomachs of pigs. And um, yeah, the, the most part of it is definitely secreted mucins, but uh, we cannot be sure that uh, um, among the, the, the secreted mucins are, are present even transmembrane mucin because of, you know, of the extraction process and uh, maybe part of the transmembrane mucin is also present. But um, so it's mostly it's mostly secreted medicine. Right. So yeah. So then that's so that's what my confusion is actually. So how does increasing? I thought I saw in your data that the lipophilicity anti-correlated with affinity, right? Initially, yeah. Yeah. right? Which makes sense based on what we just discussed. But then later on, you increase the lipophilicity, and yeah. you got stronger binding. I didn't make sense out of that actually. Why? Why does that happen? Which is this, the slide you're referring? Maybe this one? No. Yeah, this one This one tells me that lipophilicity is oppositely correlated to affinity, for example, right? Yeah. Right, and now if you go to, to when you went to your squareens, you tried to increase the lipophilicity of the squareens and you got a better yeah, result. Because, yeah, because even, even though the, the response to mucin, it's higher with uh, the lipophilicity of the squarein, the this is not related to the affinity we saw. And also mm. because we are not sure if we could talk about affinity in this case, because we are looking at the, at the interaction between an aggregate and a protein and not an interaction between the single molecule and the protein. So oh, I I'm not sure if we can talk about uh, affinity. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. okay. So, so the, you're, you're just increasing the ability to form the clusters, the aggregates, so that you can actually interact with them. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you, Cosman. I think that answers my question. Thank you very question. much for all the yeah. all the questions. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Great. So I think uh, that brings us to the end of the day. I think I will hand it over to Luca at this point to make any final announcements.